Uh, oh. uh, welcome to Columbus Web Analytics Wednesday. We're going to go ahead and get started because we've got probably about 45 minutes of content to go through uh, with a number of different presenters. My name is Tim Wilson. I'm with Web Analytics Demystified. Welcome to welcome or welcome back to Web Analytics Wednesdays. Uh, two quick shows of hands. Everybody who's a first timer. Wow, nice. Everybody who has not who has been here before but has never checked in with an iPad at Columbus Web Analytics Wednesday. Okay. I'm looking at you, Todd and Eric specifically. Sorry, Eric, Todd got the brunt of my displeasure with you. I was, it was, it was teed up and ready for him. So Web Analytics Wednesdays is there, they're seating up front here, folks, you know. Oh, you know you want to sit up front. I did, I did almost no prep with the uh, presenters. So uh, presenters, I'm going to basically jump up in between uh, each, each person and will introduce you uh, and may or may not say something accurate. Uh, Web Analytics Wednesdays are, we've been doing them for almost six years here in Columbus, they are for digital marketers, digital analysts, anyone who is interested in either of those fields, SEO, SEM. It is 40% uh, informational and maybe 60% socializing and networking, so welcome. Uh, we could not do it without scrounging up funds from various places, which we've been very successful with. Uh, but I don't have to announce any sponsors tonight. Thank you to our past sponsors whose money we're still eking out a little bit, uh, and uh, our organizers, so there's a lot of volunteering. How many people have seen an email from Columbus Web Analytics Wednesdays? How many have it going into their spam folder? Uh, our deliverability has been getting better, but email design, uh, coming up with a format, uh, uh, figuring out logistics, ordering food, there's a lot that goes into putting this on, so it is, we're, we're lucky to have a, a good group of people who are all chipping in. Sometimes at these we go around and have people raise their hand if they have a opening in digital marketing or digital analytics that they want to kind of share if they're looking to fill a role. We've got enough going on tonight that we're not doing that. Uh, but one of our volunteers, Drew, and we've, we've tried a number of different ways. We've tried a LinkedIn group. Uh, we've tried, I feel like I'm hearing music. That this is the voices in my head? Okay, kill. Um, you're fine. You're good. So there is a CBUS WW Jobs. You can post a job there. You can um, look at what's there. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. There may be some weird echo on the audio on this video. Maybe that's what I'm hearing. Presenters can tell me if they're hearing it as well. So. Uh, thanks to Drew for putting that together, but check that out if you've got a device and want to go throw a job in there. Uh, we, we definitely, there are openings in this town. There are more openings, I think, than people who are looking for them, and it's a matter of finding them. If you're a recruiter and want to throw one in there, that's fine. Put your contact information. I had said I was not going to go longer than five minutes myself, and I've probably already blown that. So tonight's format, something new. Uh, it's actually, I can, I can credit uh, one of the people who is presenting, the, the middle presenter. So Chris Grant drove down from Ann Arbor, and she has driven down multiple times for Columbus. And hopefully she keeps doing it, even though Ann Arbor's Web Analytics Wednesdays is starting to take off. So we may lose her. But she's like, look, we need to just be sharing tips. So. Uh, kind of kicked back and thought, how could we actually do that? You guys aren't hearing anything. It's very distracting up here. <laughs> Somebody's talking. So we've got seven presenters. I was hoping to get three or four. We wound up with seven. They're all going to be at five minutes sharing one tip, one example. Yeah, this is kind of stealing a little bit of, uh, of an Accelerate format. Uh, feel free to tweet out, uh, tweet who they are, use the hashtag CBSWAW, and have a good time. And if you, if you feel the need to refresh your beverage or get some more food, uh, feel free to do that as well. And we will see how logistically I'm able to switch between presentations. With that, I'm going to bring up the best dressed man of the evening, uh, Mr. Adam Powell, who is stitching together stuff 
in Google like nobody's business. I already had this open, didn't I? Okay. So actually, if you uh, gave, who is the clicker? Did I give you the clicker? It's right here. If you want to use the clicker, feel okay. free to use the clicker. Fair enough. Let's see here. Okay. For those of you who don't know, I used to sell suits. I don't get to dress up much anymore. Um, okay, so I'm primarily a marketer. I have a lot of history doing freelance. So uh, the edge that Google has is that basically there's a very low cost to start using it. Most of the things they'll let you start using for free. Um, and it's, they have great tools. I mean, their reach is unprecedented. So I'm going to walk you through kind of what I'm doing now to, to get more useful data out of those services. As we talked about, so the price is right. Um, the main things that I'm touching on here are Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, Google Webmaster Tools, and AdWords. Um, AdWords, you can get a trial for 25 bucks. Google Analytics, I've never run an account big enough to need the premium one, which is expensive if you're unfamiliar, at least by freelance standards. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the details of how and why, just those are what I'm mainly using in these. So the, uh, the gist of what I really do is I connect everything. If there's a box, I check it. If it seems relevant, I open every menu option, any place that I can find a setting to connect a service to another service, that I can integrate them, that I can go over anything. Every time I see something new, I turn it on and play with it just to see what I can get. Um, and right now there's a lot of change. Some of you may See, think that looks a little washed out as the menu bar at the top has been orange for a long time and right now they're kind of doing some with orange and some with not orange so it looks different and there is a different option in there every time I log in so that being said I'm not really going to even walk through exactly where to find things you might have to hunt a little bit they're moving all the time there's always new features but the basics of what I'm I go through are kind of outlined in the steps below. Um, I know these slides are going to be shared and I actually wrote a blog post that has even a checklist and kind of goes through this in a little more detail for anybody that actually plans on utilizing it. Um, in a, briefly, there's two flavors of Google Analytics right now primarily. One is the asynchronous snippet, which for those of you who know code looks like this. The main configurations that I do are site speed and uh, enabling demographic reporting. If you use the Google Tag Manager, there is not a pre-built option for tracking site speed in the universal snippet yet. So you really have to do it with this. Same goes for enabling demographic. It does not apply to the newer beta universal snippet yet. Um, one of the benefits of using two snippets on the same sites is that a lot of third-party, a lot of ad blockers block the uh, double-click domain is it's third party and you want, you can actually lose a lot of your data so by having two different snippets you actually make sure that even if the third party cookies are blocked and this one doesn't work that the other one will still load and you can still track reliable data so the new universal snippet which moves a lot more configuration to the server side this is the snippet i'm using now um, the main customizations here are that i rename the global object um, from ga to ga universal so that it doesn't conflict with my JavaScript variables and my tracking is accurate. Again, I like to track site speed. Um, I, you don't, I can't do that in Google Tag Manager, but you can do it if you're manually copying and pasting. So I left that in. And link ID JS, for those of you who've seen the in-page analytics, basically it gives you a heat map. And if there are multiple links on the same page that go to a single destination, it allows you to differentiate them. So let's say your header and footer navigations are the same. You can tell are people actually clicking on the header links or people actually clicking on the footer links. So that's pretty handy. So now we're going to get into the kind of the interesting stuff of how I actually use this. And wow, that's going fast. Okay, so demographics, this is for plastic surgeons. When I started going through this, I noticed the male and female ratios. I also noticed that you can now see in market segments. As I was preparing this, what I realized is that since the vast majority of their uh, people are female, 
and what I finally noticed is that they are looking to sell a house or rent an apartment. I suspect that in that 25 to 45 demographic, it's without seeming callous, a lot of women going through a divorce. And that definitely influences how I would phrase the wording on the site to be a little more affirming. Um, here we actually have an AdWords report where it's looking at paid versus organic keywords, where you rank, what you rank paid, what you rank organic, and how well you do. This gives you real clear insight. For instance, on the top one, the highest volume query is laser hair removal. We are not advertising on it, and our average position is 10.6. If I can raise that just a little bit, there's a really good chance that I can get them a lot of traffic organically at a very low cost. Same thing if you connect AdWords and Analytics. Now all of a sudden you can see bounce rate, pages per visit, other fun data in your AdWords. And you can actually see things, free clicks like map directions and stuff like that. All of this is through AdWords. Last but not least, we have assisted conversions. Assisted conversions are great if, let's say, social or something where people don't directly convert very frequently, but you want to see kind of where they go. Do they come? Do they convert immediately? Do they come back? And the next one in this series actually is where you split it down by channels and then secondary dimension of actual sources. So now you can see where do people come, where do they go, where do they go from, how do they find you, especially in a long touch customer process. This one, to filter it, I only did ones who came four times or more, but you can do two times or more. And this client even had some that had more than 10 visits before they converted. So I know I ran over, sorry about that. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Adam. So I'm figuring there's the AV. Apparently, I was I was just told to remind this, the presenters to try to try to face forward while speaking. Joe's down Joe's down in the basement adjusting adjusting levels and and videoing and uh, so yeah, no pressure. <laughs> So next up, we have uh, Maria Seguin, and Maria, I will, my, she's at Victoria's Secret, and actually has on her LinkedIn profile, I'm a little concerned, because it actually says analytics enthusiast, uh, 2011 to 2013, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what that means. She may just get up here and rip us all and say, I'm done with you people, but with that, I'll turn it over to Maria. Thanks. I promise I'm still enthusiastic about it. I swear. All right. Two questions before I start. Who thinks analytics is fun? Who in here works with social media? Awesome. All right. Okay. Well, for today, we're going to be talking about mixing it up with content, social media style. So before I begin, I want to kind of provide a little context on, so some people may feel like it's sufficient enough to look at data or numbers that are very high level, very aggregated, but what that doesn't tell you really is what exactly is working, what's not working. You really need valuable insights, and to be able to do that, you have to kind of scratch beneath the surface to really find the things that really matter to you, that really align with your objectives, your business goals. So coming from Victoria's Secret, I would probably paraphrase it more like this. Statistics are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. So if you're ever asked to evaluate your performance within social, you're not going to want to just look at your top level, high level, aggregated numbers. You're going to want to dig in deeper. Now, if you're asked, well, how is our content mix doing? You don't want to look like this. So what you want to do, we will go over here in a second. Um, so for this example, what we're going to use is Facebook data. And we're going to evaluate content mix for a given week, Mark Zuckerberg approved. The first step with any measurement process is you want to identify your objective. What is success to you? What, at the end of the day, do you consider success? Is it engagement? Is it reach, conversions, acquisition, impressions? It's imperative that you know exactly what your objective is before you start digging into the data. Second thing you want to do is establish performance benchmarks for each type. So what we did for Facebook is we looked at every single type of post content available. So here we have it broken down into single photo, 
photo album, video link, status update, which is a text only post. And we pulled the last three months worth of data. Um, and the reason we're doing three months is because as some of you may know, or some of you may not know, within Facebook, the algorithm changes almost every single second. So we have to make sure that we are on a more, um, and as even as a playing ground as possible. And doing a six month or a year, year long pool just isn't apples to apples. So we kind of like to keep the data pool a little bit tighter, just to make sure that that playing level, um, that playing ground is very level. So we have a three month pool here um, for each single type, and we have engagement benchmarks since that is our objective and we have the benchmarks for each single post. Now what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take each of those post types and we're gonna multiply them, or we're gonna actually first separate them by the number of times they are published in that week. So when you look at this pie chart here, for this given week, we, we published four single photos, we published three links, two status updates, two photo albums, and one video. And then you're gonna kind of marry the two together. So what we have here is we have the post content breakdown, we have engagement benchmark, we have the times they are published for this given week, and then we have the kind of results of where you should be based on your benchmarks. And then the actual number here is gonna be the actual number um, you derive from Facebook Insights for your actual performance that given week. So what are you gonna do with this chart? You're gonna look at this chart and you're gonna analyze and dig deeper. So for the video, for instance, we see that our actual results for this given week was seven times greater than our engagement benchmark for the video. So that kind of gives us an indicator of, wow, we really need to look into that post and see what happened. What caused that to do so well this given week? Was it a big key moment? Was it a Super Bowl video that everybody just loved and wanted to engage with? Was it um, an inclusion of a CTA? Was it a certain type of copy that we tried to do differently? What made that work? On the flip side, when you look at the status updates, you'll see that for this given week, we performed a lot lower than normal. So again, another red flag as to what made that perform so poorly for the week? Again, you know, was it something we left out? Did we try something different? Um, what happened? So because we're so intimate as publishers of our content on what may have caused these performance increases or decreases, we can pick out a couple of them. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna test, test them to make sure that our hypothesis is validated, it's strengthened, and that we know that it wasn't a one-time thing. Once we do that, we can optimize our content mix. We're gonna test and tweak. So, you're gonna keep continuing to test the factors that you feel, I totally messed this up, um, that you feel may have contributed to the decrease or increase of performance. And you're gonna to wanna to test that for a few weeks just to make sure that it's consistent. And even once you do that and you feel confident of, man, I have my content mix buttoned up, it's optimized, you still need to monitor um, your performance as well as the platforms because the social landscape is constantly changing. <laughs> I'm still trying to go in five minutes. Great. Um, the social landscape is constantly changing, so we need to pay attention to not only our performance within our content mix, but were there any algorithm changes within Facebook? Um, is user behavior shifting? Um, you know, is, I don't know, something within the platform different? You have to monitor not only the space in the platform, but your content mix as well. So it's a constantly evolving process, and you want to make sure that you're constantly looking at not only your numbers, but the space as well. And for those of you that are familiar with Avinash, the more smarter you are about things like this and you're actually diving deep below the surface and not just kind of looking at those high, high level aggregate numbers, then you're gonna be more of a digital ninja and not just a report monkey, so. Nicely done. Okay, we're gonna keep doing some more social with Miss Lee Russler, pronounced rhymes with hustler, <laughs> of Lee of Tweet My Time, and I can't say who else she works with. <laughs> Get up, you're running. There, or you can do it with, uh, this will do it too. Okay. Forward back. I hate public speaking, so please bear with me. I'm so much better behind a keyboard than in person. Um, I started looking at, okay, faking native, native advertising. This is just for Facebook, but um, you can push this content out to Twitter. Um, it doesn't work so well with G+, but um, it's in a response to um, Zuckerberg starting to become, well, maybe not Zuckerberg himself, but um, 
Facebook is start Facebook is starting to become like the the mat cuts with oblique references. Of, oh, we're going to change it this way, that way, and, and we really don't know what what they're going to do next. So we like quality news. Thanks. That means nothing. I, I mean, it really does. It, you just got to sit there and test and figure out what what the hell they actually mean by that. Um, so. The, I did a, a little bit of testing, and I found out that, um, and I think what they meant was like use the um, share button from a specific news site like the New York Times. But when I did that, it didn't really do much of anything for me. I don't know if it's done anything for anybody else. But um, I volunteer for this organization. Um, so I, I Googled, um, I went through, um, what is it say? Facebook graph, and I like Googled stuff that they were, or I searched stuff that they were interested in <laughs> um, from the from the graph, and um, then applied that search onto the New York Times, which is supposedly one of the 30 sites that Facebook has chosen to be the golden children of news. So I pulled something on there about um, how to succeed in college. So I threw the the post up there. And I switched it out, and that's the organization I volunteer for. And so you um, remove the, the big giant T, and you put um, whatever it is you want, but you need to make sure that you have some sort of branding in there. It's really subtle, and this is something that maybe isn't going to work for everyone um, because of the nature of the content. It's probably going to work better for individuals who are trying to be God help me for this buzzword, thought leaders. Um, you know, like posing in a, some sort of, it, it's got to be kind of like what the, the article is, is referring to. So, yeah, the sorority girls are being thought leaders here. Okay. Um, that was me at one point, so, okay. Um, so this is, what, this is what it looks like when it's shared on, um, on a laptop. And it, it turns out really well because it looks like I'm I'm kind of borrowing the um, authority juice from the New York Times. So there's that. And then this is what it looks like on mobile. It's really sweet on mobile, and it has a tendency to take off. So, but that was my uh, that was my tip. The end. <laughs> I hope somebody's efficiently getting all these little one-line zingers, because I'm not. Huh? What? Sweet. Okay. To the midway point, and as I said, so Chris is, maybe this is a dubious thing at this point, she's widely regarded as a absolute web trends expert, but as I said, she's come down. <laughs> is that, you're like, yay. Awesome. So she is, I will once again credit her for prompting us to try this format, even though she didn't explicitly say this format. So she may also tell me later that's not what I meant at all. But I roped her into presenting, and with this, I will turn it over to Chris. Right. So we're moving away from social here, and we're going back to website data analytics, which is what I do. Um, and I'm kind of being agnostic about the tool, but on the other hand, WebTrans is the one that got us started on this, so I'm going to give them a little, a few bit of props about that. Now, can I, I want to face the microphone, so if I, this is going to follow, okay. The most difficult and crazy question that I ever got, which brought my entire analytics team to a complete screeching halt in a customer meeting, was after we had gone through their first analytics report and showed them everything that was happening on their site, the main lady at the other end said, Chris, I still don't understand what people do on my site. You show me all this stuff. And so we said, there, we said, now you don't have to read this, but look at this list of all the pages on your site, and this is what people do. See the most popular page? And she says, no, that's about pages. That's not about what people do on my site. I don't have a feeling for what people do on my site. So we said, well, we can do path analysis. And she said, oh, that's nice. I like the top path. That makes sense. How many paths are there? And we said about 15,000 different paths. And she said, okay, that's not telling me what people do. Okay, so we said, oh, but we have this really cool thing that Google Analytics now offers. 
And this is what people do on your site. And she said, you've got to be kidding me. And so then we went back to Amateur and we said, you know, we can put together these little clusters of three separate pages and we can tell you how many people do this page, page A, then B, then C, and how many people do A, then C, then D. And she says, that's very nice, but how do I know that I should be looking at A and B and C? I mean, of all the combinations, there's thousands of combinations on my site. And so we went on from Omniture Omniture's to Omniture's path analysis. We said, how about this? And she says, nope. And we said, well, we have this other tool, and <laughs> they'll do this. And she said, I don't know what people do on the site. So we were, we were actually, we had to admit she was absolutely right. We were not telling her what people were doing on her site. What she needed was 10% of my people come to my site and they do search right away for a specific product and they buy the product and they're gone. And 22% of the people come on and they muck around and they look at things and maybe they buy something and maybe they don't. And then there's these other people and they come and all they want to see is what's new on my site and they're gone. Maybe they'll buy something. Okay. So we said, okay, that we understand. We can do that. Ha ha. So we went back to Web Trends and we tricked Web Trends into, by doing some very clever hacking, we tricked Web Trends into giving us 30,000 paths, each 20 steps long. Basically, it was a complete summary of, I mean, not five steps, not three steps like Omniture, but 20 steps. So it was a complete summary in one Jmongo file of what everybody did. And so there was a three-step path, and it had 7,000 people did this three-step path, and then there's another three-step path, and 2,000 people did that. So we had this complete list, all right? And then, and now this is what we went through to get to where we're going. Then we took all the possible combinations. Oh, by the way, we dissolved the data down previously, not to individual pages. We did it in clumps, like the entire customer service area, the entire product area, the entire what's new area, whatever. Okay, so we did some sort of analytic smart stuff about what those clumps were. So you can see 30,000 paths, even when we clump the data, was still massive. So then we figured out all the possible pairs of every clump with every other clump and how often that pair happened in the same visit. So we're going from long paths to just single little pairs. And then we went from there to a, basically a correlation matrix which listed every one of the content groups, every one of the content groups and how often they happened together. Once we have this, we're going, oh, I did this in graduate school. What we do with this is we either do multidimensional scaling. Uh, well, I don't have the tool that will do that, but we do have this thing called a correlogram, which is a manual technique, and I would be happy to tell you how to do it. It's really quite simple. It takes a while. You need a whiteboard. You need uh, um, Visio or something. But you take those pairs, and you put the pairs that are closely related, really close to each other, and you make the circle of what that clump is, what that content area is, proportional in size to how many people actually did it. So by using distance and proximity and a lot of moving around, um, thank God for Visio, you end up with this is sort of what people do. This is how the content of your site is related to itself within the same visit. Then once you've done that, then you bring in the analysts. And these are the people that understand, try to understand at least what's really, really going on. Uh, they look at this and they say, you know, within that crazy thing, this is what I see. You have one, two, three, four, five, six different visit types happening, and we can make a really good case for them. And they make sense, and they're going, yes, you know, but we have personas. And we only have uh, five personas. So you've got two more personas here. You've got two more scenarios. Yes. That's, that's really what we have. We have used the data to give us personas or scenarios. This is the point where the interesting discussion with the client starts. Um, once we have presented those, all kinds of things start breaking loose. And they'll say, you know, all that reporting that you've been doing before, that was fine. But what I really want is I really like those groups. I believe in every single one of them. Um, group D, I hate what people are doing in Group D. 
they're coming and they're looking at what's new and they're leaving right away. I want group D out of there and I want group D to merge into this other group. And so they start talking about what they want to do with the things that people are doing on the site and they want to shrink one group and then they want another group bigger, things like that. And then furthermore, they want our reports to tell them how big these groups are over time because they're going to try to influence the mix of the groups. So we change our reporting using clever filtering and content groups and things like that so that we can actually report on how much traffic is happening in each one of these typologies. And so we go through all of these sort of things. You can read them yourself. Um, for real estate site, we find out that every one of those clumps, every one of those visit types is actually a separate visit and they actually go through before they finally decide to make an appointment to see a house. They go through very, very different types as they try to make their decision. We try to figure out what the timing is, the size is, all that, and that's pretty much it. This is the payoff because it's the most valuable discussions that we have with our clients. And that's all I've got. So Chris will be over at the flippy chart a little bit later, walking through how to actually build a Corellogram. Uh, <clears throat> wow. Okay, so our next presenter is uh, basically got roped into this on very, very short notice, is our second out-of-town presenter and is in from New York. When did you get in? This morning. This morning. Hot diggity dog. So, so I, will, I will give the very brief story. I've just happened to fortuitously have started working with Sprinkler a little bit, and I sent out the call for presenters to this, and Aaron, where'd he go? Ah, was like, hey, we got this person who could speak. She'd be awesome. She's not here. Um, uh, as it happened, I'd actually met Anna, I think, two days earlier. Um, or I'd had an email. I'd been on a call with her, and then I met her in person. And when I was talking to her in person, she was really excited about coming. And then she also started talking about how she, they were, she was hoping to get women on Wednesdays going to New York again. And she had this lady, Nicolette, who's super enthusiastic, and she's awesome, and she's great, and she's going to get her. And then... Anna pulled out and wasn't able to make it. She had a conflict, but Nicolette, we wound up with her instead. So thanks for pinch hitting on very short notice, and I will turn it over to you. So. Um, well, thank you all for, for uh, bearing with me on short notice. But um, first of all, I'd love to talk to you guys about uh, return on investment on social. I'm going to steal a little bit of Maria's thunder and um, ask you guys to raise your hands again. Who works in social in this room? Okay, so a fair amount of you. Um, probably all of your companies invest in social in one way or the other, whether or not it's uh, with paid media or, or not, but um, I'm gonna talk about a couple different ways that people can look at social ROI. Um, so first off, uh, whether or not you guys raised your hand, last quarter, Facebook and Twitter made $2.5 billion off of advertising and promoted posts. Um, so it's obviously a huge market and there's a lot of money that's being poured into it. So it makes sense that those companies that are spending that money want to make sure that that money is well invested. Um, the, the problem with that issue, you know, with, with that whole thing overall is that the theories around ROI are less tangible than we'd actually like them to be. A lot of them are based off percentages of percentages and assumptions of assumptions and they're not as concrete as we, uh, as we would hope. Um, but I think that there's actually another way to look at the whole formula that would give us more confidence making decisions based off of ROI. Um, so this is actually a formula that Anna came up with, um, who was supposed to be sitting here right now, or standing here right now. Um, but it's, I think, a very interesting representation of how to look at ROI um, and thinking in terms of performance versus the actual energy or money that you're pouring into it, um, and then the outcome that you get from that. So um, the problem that I am seeing time and time again when I am discussing ROI with people is that they are most fo focused on the top half of this equation, only want to see what is the value of a like, what is the value of a comment, what is the value of whatever engagement they're doing on social, when truthfully it's about the whole equation. Um, and the, sorry, next slide. <laughs> um, my theory behind the reason that everybody loves to talk about performance is because social engagement feels nice. You know, everybody likes to get likes. Everybody likes to talk about hitting a hundred or, you know, a million likes on Facebook or whatever. But the truth is, is that people are going to love the way that popularity feels no matter how much they spend on it. And that's not actually a really good 
you know, uh, indicator of how well you're performing on social. Um, and so I'd rather, you know, especially when you're paying for uh, promoted posts or sponsorships on social, you can get a lot of mix in there. So there's both genuine brand love and then not so genuine brand love. Um, and when you're actually looking at this, um, sorry, I'm going all over the place. Um, but by sharing this, I'm not talking about not, um, um, don't ignore content strategy altogether, or social performance altogether. Uh, it's very important to have a balance there. Um, but truthfully, you need to talk more about, um, you know, there needs to be more emphasis on the bottom half of this equation, um, which is, sorry, I'm getting all in my notes. Um, <laughs> many likes. Yeah, so, the, um, sorry. The, on the bottom half of this equation, there's a lot more that companies have control of. Um, whether, you know, versus having the control of how many, how many engagements they get with a specific post. They have much more control of how much money and how much time they're pouring into getting whatever performance they're getting out. Um, so as we know from basic arithmetic, if you want to increase the resources element of this equation, you can either increase the top or you can decrease the bottom. And um, I'm focusing more on um, focusing energies on decreasing the bottom half while hoping that performance is either increasing by good content strategy or, or at least staying level set. You're not pouring that money into promoted posts. It's just a one-off engagement, a one-off strategy. Um, and the uh, working with large businesses, which is what Sprinkler does, especially um, my team, uh, we know that there are so many different moving pieces and there's so many ways that you can shave off a second here or a minute here or an hour if you're, if you're lucky, that when you add all of those elements together, it can play, pay huge dividends. Um, and, you know, therefore, by taking, um, taking these companies into consideration um, and what they're doing on social and helping them achieve more with less, um, you actually can be decreasing this bottom half and hopefully getting um, higher performance on the top. Um, and whether that is manifested in, you know, reaching out to communities across the, you know, across the world or um, decreasing the time that people are spending on reporting or um, increasing the number of customers that they're able to service in one day. Um, all of those are, are decreasing or increasing efficiencies, but decreasing the assets and efforts that you guys are pouring into the bottom half of this equation. Um, so the answer probably is why everyone's focused only on the top and rather the bottom is that um, social engagement numbers that are big and large and exciting are probably sexier than decreasing average response times, which are actually just as important when you think back to the elements of this equation, which is that they're both inputs and whether they're increasing the top or decreasing the bottom, it doesn't matter. It's, the result is actually pushing out that same increased resources. Um, so social as an ent entity, um, sorry, um, social as an entity uh, proves that um, you know, allows companies to connect with customers in a human interaction kind of way, in a very um, personable way. And um, instead of buying their love, we're advocating more that you should be earning it and you should be focusing on servicing your customers better, um, you know, whether that's engaging with them when they reach out in, in, um, with interest in your brand or um, you know, pr uh, producing content that they really appreciate that you know well enough that your audience would appreciate. Um, that you're actually being able to have this human connection with this and human interaction with them. Um, and, you know, there are different ways to do this, and um, you'd be surprised how much you can get done if you, ear if you switch that uh, money that you're earmarking towards promoted posts and advertising on social to actually building that social infrastructure and building the efficiencies into the way that you guys are doing social with your companies. Um, and that making this change won't, result, won't only result in benefits for your company, but it will be more long term. It's not just a one shot injection of content or, or a one shot injection of, of engagement. It's actually building that infrastructure to create engagement as a long term process and create that brand love on social. Ta da! That's it. <laughs> I can't believe we're 39 minutes into this and I rambled for the first nine minutes. Uh, there's a lot, a lot we're going through here. So, and my palms are sweaty. Since Joe Brancato's down in the basement, I feel like I should just throw his name in. So he has to think about editing it out. Go, Joe. So, next presenter. Um, is now, how long have you lived here now? It's been longer than that. Really? Okay. 
So April Wilson, I've actually seen her present at uh, eMetrics. We have actually had people in the industry thinking that we're related, um, and we will neither confirm nor deny. Uh, anybody? There was a podcast recently that just went through the history of that uh, that phrase. So uh, April is always uh, super entertaining. She is going to ramble. Uh, Joe, I'll warn you now, crank up the crank up the gain because she'll be moving around the stage. And with that, I will turn it over to April Wilson. Can I just turn the mic on? Does that oh. help? Can y'all hear me? Was that going to be that? Joe, can you hear that? Yell yeah, really loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm not a rule follower and I refuse A, to stand behind the podium and B, to put my name tag on because I'm just a pain in the ass like that. So I tried to think if I had five minutes to tell you something that would help you do your job better tomorrow when you go into the office, it's not going to be about tools. It's not going to be about data because the technology is always going to grow to capture more data faster than it is to measure it. So we are always going to be plagued with those problems. Today what I'm going to talk to you is about how to influence the highest paid person in your organization. So I've been doing this for a really long time. This is my NASCAR slide. I'm really old. And for those of you that have been in the industry for a long time, you know that I can be both sweet and very bossy, just like Lucy. So in the next five minutes, I'm going to go through the five types of hippos you are likely to find in your organization, how to identify which one you've got, and have the secondary side effect of making you all feel self-conscious about the way that you walk after you get up out of these seats, and then how to A, get them excited about your damn data, because if you didn't get excited about your data, you wouldn't be here, and B, get them to take action on the damn data. So. That, in the 10 years that I've been doing digital analytics, is probably the most frustrating piece. And I will be walking, not runway style. I feel pressure because we've got Victoria's Secret in the house. But <clears throat> I will show you how they walk into a room. So if you can get to the room before they do, this will save your bacon, I promise you. So just to make sure that we all know what I'm talking about, the hippo is the highest paid person's opinion. So it depends on who's in the meeting at that particular point in time. It's not likely to be your CEO unless you're in a really small organization. It's likely to be one of their direct reports or one of their direct reports, direct reports. And I think at the onset, <laughs> whenever you meet with a hippo, we all look the same. We look like skeptical little hippos, but that's not true. There's actually five distinct types, and we're going to go through each of them right now. So the first one is the insecure hippo. The insecure hippo is worried that somebody else's department or group knows more or is better than their department or group. You will know this person because they tend to monopolize meetings by talking the most and talking the loudest. They also, when they walk into a room, tend to have a very chest, I, I feel self-conscious, um, everybody look at my chest. Um, <laughs> they have a very chest-driven orientation, so the chest is going to drive the whole way they walk. They're going to walk into the room a little bit like this. If you can get in there first, they're going to lead with their chest. That's how you identify your insecure hippo. To get them excited about your data, you need to show them how they or their department are achieving great results with digital media, or whatever it is you measure if you're not actually in digital. If you want to get them to do something with that data, you're going to say, your already awesome results, oh great and mighty one, can be even better if you do X, Y, Z. You will achieve rock star stature if you do these things. Okay? So that's type one. Type two is the nosy hippo. This is a hippo that's very much like the insecure hippo. Only they're not worried about what they're doing. They're really worried about what everybody else is doing, and they want the data to support what they think is going on in other people's departments. So they're always butting into the business. They will tend to ask you to get data, send quick re requests over to you, not really explain why they're asking for it. Bless their little hearts, they have really good intentions but they're so data and numbers focused that they can be very destructive in an organization. So to get them excited about the data, you're gonna say, yeah, I can get the answers that you want, but to keep them away from destroying your organization or tearing down teamwork, you're gonna focus on how all of the data is integrated, the butterfly effect of the customer experience, right? 
So if you do this one thing in this one area, there's going to be a ripple effect, so tread cautiously. They tend to have a bit of an anal orientation when they walk, so it's almost like they're clenching a dollar bill between their butt cheeks, and they're going to tend to walk a little bit like this. <laughs> Get into the room first. This is a good thing to note. These people will also be heavily influenced by spreadsheets. I don't know why. <laughs> the third hippo type is your get along hippo. These are folks that value teamwork and cohesion above results. They want everybody to feel happy. They want everybody to feel included. They want everybody to feel like they're part of decision making, almost to the point where nothing gets accomplished. <laughs> So for these folks, you need to let them know that taking action is going to benefit multiple groups. And if you want to tip them over the edge from consideration into action, show them case studies of how whatever it is you're advocating works in other organizations. These folks, their body orientation tends to be, and I picked this slide A because it's funny, but B because they're very stomach oriented. Whether they have a big stomach or not, they're going to lead with their stomach. They want everybody to get along. Very hard to distinguish between the anal and the stomach type. The stomach, the anal ones clench, the stomach ones are more loose in their approach. So think Santa Claus, think an average coach, and that's how you can identify those folks. Now the fourth type is your BS hippo, which I almost called the MBA hippo, but I've met some MBAs that are actually not BS hippos. These are the hippos with fletulent hearts you are going to want to avoid because you are never going to know why they're asking what they're asking. If you're stuck on a long-term project with these people, they are always going to ask you to go do something else, even if the something else is something they asked you to undo a month ago. I promise you, you will never get anywhere with these folks. They tend to talk in meaningless phrases, corporate jargon. They never say anything of essence, but for some reason, usually the CEO values this person's opinion, and we don't understand why. Their body orientation, please don't anybody get me fired, is a groin orientation. <laughs> so think farmer's daughter. Now, this one's harder to pick up. It's the rarest of the body types. But you know them because they're loose and they're walking like a panther on the prowl. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Try to avoid these folks, if at all possible. But the last one is your sexy hippo, right? These are folks that love data. They understand why it's sexy. They're very cerebral. They could almost be in a university professor setting and be at home in that place. Um, they get excited about you, but the risk with these folks is that they can get all dreamy in the academic possibilities of what you can do, almost to the point of not wanting to take action, but always wanting to learn more. But these are your champions, and the secret key to these folks is that they're often trying to take down the BS hippo because it drives them nuts. Now, when they walk into a room, their orientation is going to be head. They're going to leave with their head. I'm a head. So if you watch me walk, this is me. Now, if they have a smartphone in their hand, everybody looks like a head. So you can't watch them walk into a room if they're looking at their smartphone. You're going to get an inaccurate read of what your hippo is like. But these are the folks you want to find because they're actually going to get excited about what you do. They're going to understand the innovation, the optimization, all of the possibilities inherent in everything that we do because we love what we do. They're going to love it too. So. As a quick recap, if you want to print this out and stick it in your cube as a conversation starter, if there's only one thing you remember, just remember the body type because it will come in very handy later. Thank you. You ready to follow that, Brian? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so this brings us to wait, wait, our, wait. What? I do hear voices. It's you Joe do. in the basement. He needs to. Is Joe? That's a good boy. I don't know how to get to the basement. <laughs> Joe, text text me where the basement is. <laughs> wow, and I just realized that even though I got my laptop plugged in, it's apparently not actually plugged in. You've got five minutes, buddy, and that's it. I've got thirty percent. I'll be like three minutes. So 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 Brian, I will I will uh, Brian's with thirty one gifts. Uh, I have it on good authority that he is. Uh, Sleeping with one of the presenters. I've used that joke before. 
never gets old. It never gets old. Not to me. And <laughs> all about me. So Brian, I will say, is is uh, I met Brian several years ago. Had seen him on Twitter, and he uh, is like the the analyst dream. That he has got like a design and UX kind of background, and is very interested in into the data. So we have been super lucky to have him as a co-organizer. Uh, and I, with that, I will turn it over to our last presenter of the night. Thank you. Walk well. All right, I will not be walking around now because uh, that just totally freaked me out and I don't know what kind of hippo I am. <laughs> not that I'm the highest paid person in here, I just don't want to you know, resemble a hippo. So I want to talk to you today about the crashes and exceptions report, which is the coolest sounding report in Google Analytics, right? But what the crashes and exceptions report is, is it's for apps, right? So you have an app, you want to know whether it's crashed or there was an exception in the app. And basically what that means, did this app just totally you know, shut down? You went to the home screen, why'd that happen? Or was there an exception? You just got an error message or something like that. So what I love about the crashes and exceptions report that crash. That is awesome. Not for the regular analyst, but what I can do is I can take that to a developer and they can actually understand what that means and fix it quickly. So if I, you know, put something in the app store and a couple hours later I'm seeing, you know, ooh, I've got 5,400 crashes. I better go do something about this really quickly, right? So I love this piece. So my, my primary dimension here is looking at the uh, exception description. So it's telling me exactly what that is and how many crashes that's caused. So in this instance, uh, this string has caused 33 crashes. So I can take that back to them and they can continue to look at that. But my tip for the evening is to make this into an understandable and actionable uh, report for the people that don't want to read uh, a lot of JavaScript. So I, let's see if my, uh, see my little arrow moved up there at the top? Here, I'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> So my primary dimension is still the exception description, but now I'm adding a secondary description of a screen name. And basically when you're building out an app, much like you do with a title tag on a page in HTML, you can say, wait, I got another animation. So yeah, I can go up there and say the screen name is actually this. So um, when I'm looking at this, it goes down and it kind of truncates out that big long string of things and tells me exactly what's going on here. And as I'm looking down through this, I see some things that may be troubling me and ooh, so uh, what I'm looking at here is, you know, number seven on my list, you know, I'm two, four, two, four, 6,400. What I'm seeing in this instance is an invalid username or password on the login. If that's the first thing they do in your app, that could be very bad, right? So that could uh, be a, a very uh, uh, decremental thing to uh, actually putting in orders or something like that that you would do in the app. So this becomes a great tool for me to take back to the UX folks and say, hey, we have a lot of people that are having issues, so why don't we do some simple things where you know, we can go in and affect the UI and the UX and say, remember password, that way I reduce the friction, they can just log into the app, they don't have to type things in. So that is my quick tip in less than three minutes, I probably have 28% left on, on the thing here. So thank you very much. And Joe is lubricated. Uh, I found him. You, you might actually want to get a tour of the Ohio State Bar Association's room. Uh, I think we're in high def. Uh, uh, that the video is going to be more than I possibly could have imagined. So it is quite the quite the setup down there. It is a little convoluted. Uh, I'm I'm so excited about this that I'm out of breath, not because I just tried to run back up. So. Uh, that is what we have. Everyone is around. So the presentations are all, I gotta do a little update for Adams, but the presentations are posted at bit.ly slash feb WAW. So they'll be there when and if, I seriously think we've got so much digital video and audio capture that it may take us three years to actually <laughs> splice together the final cut, but I will post that there as well. Uh, the presenters will be sticking around, I think. Uh, so pounce away. I know there's still beer back there. I'm not sure if there's still food. And thanks for coming and give us feedback. Thanks.